C Sharp 11 and .NET 7 are hopefully going to be released in November 2022. And this raises the question, as a developer, what new updates will I get which will make my life much easier and amazing? And we're going to answer that in this video. So what you're going to learn is how to install .NET 7 and enable preview capabilities in Visual Studio. We're then going to look at the five greatest features in .NET 7 that I think will make your life much easier. So if you want to learn what's new in the future, then my friend, this is the video for you. When it comes to thinking about ASP.NET 7, there's one really important consideration that you need to make first. And that is when you should smash on the subscribe button and click on the like button to help me out with the YouTube algorithm. Serious aside, if you're new to this channel, then my name is John and I do weekly YouTube videos on web development, C Sharp, all that good stuff. So if that sounds good to you, you know what to do. And as a little reward, I'll show you some programming advice by Chuck Norris. Hmm. So enough of this nonsense. Let's have a look at how we can install .NET 7 within Visual Studio. In order to get going with C Sharp 11, you need to make sure that the .NET 7 framework is installed on your PC. Now you can do this through Visual Studio, but the easy way is just to do a search for .NET 7. From the Microsoft site, you'll be able to see this download. Now, simply installing this executable won't allow you to magically and automatically create .NET 7 projects in Visual Studio. You're also going to need to make sure that you have the correct version of Visual Studio and that you've also got preview capabilities enabled. So let's see how we can do that now. We're now inside my Visual Studio 2022, and to make sure that we're using the latest version, you'll want to go to the Help menu and then click on Check for Updates. Now, when we're checking for updates, there's a caveat. Out of the box, Visual Studio will only look for official updates. And in order to get .NET 7 to work, we need to have a preview update. This means that we're going to need to change the default settings. So hopefully on here, you can see this Change Update Settings little option. What we need to do is click on that. And as you can see in this update channel, we need to make sure that preview is selected. Once you switch your version to preview in the version available to install, you can see that I've now got access to install this preview version. So 7.40 preview 1.0. Doing this, updating it should take about five minutes. After you do that, you can then start to use .NET 7 in your solution. As we're talking about preview features, I think it's worthwhile for you to know there's also another way to enable certain preview capabilities. So just because you've installed the latest version of .NET and Visual Studio, often you might need to go to Tools and then Options. And then from here, you'll type in Preview. And from the Preview Feature tab, we can see here Preview Features. Sometimes you might need to explicitly turn on certain things. So as you can see, we've got enable port tunneling, enable Windows format process. So sometimes if you're expecting a feature to be enabled and it's not, it's worth coming in here just to make sure you don't need to tick an extra box. That's all you need to do to get going with .NET 7 on your Visual Studio. Should only take you a few seconds. Next, let's look at how we can create a .NET 7 app. Creating a .NET 7 project is exactly the same as creating any other type of .NET project. So we can just go to New, Project, then from here, we can pick any one of our templates. So let's use the core web app. Then I'm going to click Next. I'm going to put in some metadata, click Next again. And then if you followed the install instructions correctly, you should now see a .NET 7 preview from the framework dropdown. Now, if you just want to upgrade one of your existing projects, what you want to do is open your CS proj file. And then from here, you want to make sure that your target framework is set to NET 7.0. And you also want to make sure that we have this Lang version preview. So let's have a look at some of the features that you can now start using. Make sure I keep your attention. I'm going to go through the more powerful features towards the end of the video. Sneaky, right? Now, the first feature we're going to look at is argument checking. Now, whenever we're creating a class and we're passing an argument to a constructor or a method, in order to make sure that the program works as we expect it to, sometimes we write code like this. So we create a guard clause. So we pass in this name parameter here, and we check if name equals null, otherwise we throw an argument null exception, throw some sort of exception message. Now, within .NET 7, we've got a much simpler way of doing this type of checking, and that's using the argument exception dot throw if null or empty. By simply passing in that name, we can now create our guard. 
And historically, I used to create a brand new class to do this type of function. Now, unfortunately, there was a proposal in C Sharp 11 to make that even shorter. So instead of writing this code, there was a proposal that we had these double bangs and this would do exactly the same feature. However, apparently these double bangs created loads of controversy. It's been pulled from C Sharp 11 as an April. So this might be in C Sharp 12. However, for now, you have to make do with this argument exception. However, it's still definitely a nice touch. The purpose of the next feature is also to make sure that class is instantiated quickly. Now, if you're creating frameworks or packages that other developers need to implement, how do you make sure that when someone inherits from your base class that they set the correct properties? And this is where this sets required members attributes comes into play. So let's have a look how we use it. So you can see we've got a simple base class and in here we're passing in this parameter called unused. Now the error I've got is non nullable property my prop must contain a value. And this is because I've also created this additional property. So it's called my prop. And as you can see, it's got this required operator. So as a framework creator, what we can do is define our base class, define properties with the required, and then have our set required members. To get rid of my error, all I need to do is my prop. And then let's assign it an empty string. As you can see, we've now got rid of that issue. Now I can take this even further. I'm inheriting from my base class. I've also got a scoped my second prop. I'm also using sets required members. I'm passing in the base type. So I know that my prop one is being set. I'm also then setting and initializing my second prop. So for framework developers, this can be really handy to make sure that implementers do what you expect them to do. The next feature is generic attributes. Now, surprising as it seems, because we can use generics literally everywhere in .NET, we couldn't create attributes with generic. That has now changed in .NET 7. Historically, if you wanted to say pass a type in an attribute, you might have to do something like this, where we define our attribute, then define a constructor parameter and pass in a type. The code for this might look something similar to this, where we inherit my attribute, we pass in an object type, job is a good one. However, with .NET 7, those days have gone. Instead, we can get rid of that mumbo jumbo and use this instead. So as you can see in this example, I've created an attribute and passing string as type T. And looking at the code, this means that we can now do attribute and then here's my type T, jobs are good. So again, it's not going to revolutionize how you do development, but it's just going to make your code a little bit nicer and a little bit shorter. The next feature in the list is probably the most powerful one, and it's list based pattern matching. So being able to do pattern matching on lists, enumerables, arrays, that kind of stuff. Now, I think F sharp has been a bit of inspiration for C sharp because over the last few versions, the pattern matching capabilities in C sharp has got much better. And again, in .NET 7, we can do more things. Now, when it comes to pattern matching, it's kind of two things that you need to know. So first there's discard. So discard is created by doing this underscore. Classic example here is that we've got a method where we're returning three things. So I'm returning these three strings and I can use discard in this way and then define my property here. Discard does what it says. It will discard anything within a pattern. The other operator is called slice, represented by two little dots. Slice will allow you to pattern match on zero or more elements. So what we do is we define a pattern, we put the slice and the slice is going to contain everything which isn't included in the pattern. So I think it's much easier to go through a walking example. So let's have a look at it. On the screen in front of us, you can see my slice example. What we're doing is passing in an array of numbers and we're doing return numbers is, and then we've got our pattern here. So remember when we're doing pattern matching, it's in square braces. And with this particular pattern, we're matching on the character one and the character 10. And then what we're saying is everything in the middle, we don't care about. So as long as it starts with a one and ends with a 10, this is a valid pattern match. And let's have a look at some of our codes. So I've got some example above. So we've got one and 10. So this is gonna be a match because we don't care about the middle bit. One, two and 10, again, it's gonna be a match because the slice is gonna take out the two. 
one, two, seven, seven, fifty six. It could be whatever. We could carry on and on. As long as we're finishing with a 10, the slice is going to take this out. And we don't care. In example four, you can see that we don't have a one or a 10. So this should fail. And then in the final example, because the pattern doesn't start with a one, we're not going to have the slice in this example because the slice would be applied to here. So that's two, seven, seven and 10. And if we look at examples, you can see that one is true, two is true and three is true, just as you'd expect. And then four is false and five is false because this pattern has not been validated. The pattern matching improvements within .NET 7 isn't specifically around slice or discard. It's the ability to start creating patterns on arrays or lists. So let's have a look at a few examples just to make sure we get your head around it. One of the things we can do in .NET 7 is start doing pattern matching within our if statements. So remember, pattern matching is by our square braces here. And in this example, we're passing an array of numbers. And the pattern is saying that if this array of numbers ends with a five, we've got a match. And this is obviously a lot more short and concise code compared to maybe doing some sort of lambda expression, doing a last, maybe do an index of, or having to create some logic to figure this out. Now we can take this even further and we can start adding patterns inside of switch statements. Now in this pattern, you can see that we're making use of discard and we're making use of slice. This particular pattern is saying, ignore the first element. We're going to ignore the last element and then we're going to use the slice to get everything in between. Now, when we're using the slice, we're going to add this into a brand new variable called entries. And then in our Lambda, you can see that we're then going to do a string dot join with all of those data points. This means that if we pass in this type of string, which had discard one, two, three, and discard, based on this pattern, the first discard is going to be ignored. The second discard is going to be ignored. The slice is going to grab one, two, three, and put that into this entries variable here. And then in this code, we're just going to iterate through entries and render out one plus two plus three. Job is a good one. So as you can see, pattern matching is extremely powerful and it's going to make your code much cleaner when you have to do this type of lookup on arrays or lists. The last feature that I'd like to point out is the one that I think you'll use the most, and that is an improvement about how you can create strings. In C Sharp, one of the limits when we create strings is that if you need to create a string that contains either a double or a single quote, the compiler is going to complain. And the way that we get around that is by putting in the escape key. Now, we don't need to worry about that pesky little escape anymore, because now, using the raw string, we can just create string literals how we want to. Now, granted, the raw string sounds like some sort of sexually transmitted disease that you don't want your doctor to tell you about. In fact, it's a brand new way of creating strings. Now, as you can see on the screen, in order to create a raw string, you use the three double quotes and you finish it with the three double quotes. And inside of our string, you can see that I've got some double quotes going on. I've got some single quotes. I'm free to add in what I want in here. So as you can see, I've got things like the single quote I can add in and look at this. I'm not getting any type of error whatsoever. I can add in anything I want. It is fine. There is a caveat when we're using the raw string in this format is as you can see, I've got things on different lines. I've even got a tab in here. If I tried to put this line of text all on the same line, you can see straight away, ah, no error. And the only way that I can get rid of this now is to put everything on a single line. Gone away. So yeah, this is the caveat that if you want to use a new line or you want to add tabs, you just need to make sure that the raw string definition starts without anything else and ends without anything else. And in between, you're free to do whatever you want. Now, the other feature we get in .NET 7 around strings is an improvement over the verbatim string interpolation feature. I can never say it. When we're using verbatim string interpolation, blah, blah, blah feature, it's basically anything which has a dollar and a double quote. So it starts like this. In the C sharp 10, we wouldn't be able to do something like this. We'll get an error. And that is because we can't put new lines within the string. Within C sharp 10, 
we could do something kind of like this but then as soon as we start going new line we're going to get error so this again probably something you don't need to remember or worry about but we can start formatting our code and our strings in a lot more nicer format the caveat with this one again is that you just need to make sure that you have some string in between your closing bracket and your opening bracket but aside from that you're free to start using a new line in a new place you win the final thing to say before wrapping up is that if you're interested in dotnet 7 and you want to have a look at the code that you've seen on the video today you can get a copy of it all you need to do is go over to my github which is john d jones dash poc proof of concept there'll be a link below in the repositories just find a preview of net 7 in here clone go mental do what you want with it that concludes our tour of c sharp 11 and asp.net 7. now personally i think there's some really good new features in this release i don't think there's anything which is groundbreaking which is going to completely revolutionize how i do development but there are a nice few features like the pattern matching which is going to make my code simpler now i am really interested out of the features we've covered which one are you most looking forward to please let me know in the comments below because I might do further videos on them. If you want to see me doing more topics on C Sharp, .NET 7, .NET 6, please let me know because it's something I don't normally do too often. Now, we've got to the stage of the video. But I need to say it again. If you haven't already, please click on the subscribe button so you don't need this content and also help me out with YouTube algorithm by clicking on the like so other people can see this video and then other people can see the video and everyone can like it and we can all like everything and we can live in one. Mm -hmm. Now the final way if you want to keep in contact with me is to subscribe to my Sunday session newsletter. The link is below. It's free. All you're going to do is get an email every Sunday with some jokes in it and some industry news, some tips on how to become a better programmer. If you like it, brilliant. If you don't, you can unsubscribe. Who cares? So from that, we've reached the end. I hope you found some value from this video. Until next time, happy coding.